Just before we get into today's episode of The Casual Criminalist, let me tell you about another podcast slash YouTube channel called Red web if you enjoy this show i really think you'll dig their show i've listened to a bunch of episodes and you'll see why there's plenty of crossover they've given me some talking points by the way and i think those will highlight why it's quite a good match for this show just listen to this do you love mysteries cryptids and true crime introducing red web a podcast made for casual mystery lovers who want a closer look at the unknown as well as some laughs i think in the description for this show i write true crime casually done throwing in some laughs or something like that so yeah you can see why it's a good crossover right each week the hosts will take you through a new case discussing the timelines and theories surrounding it offering their insight as well as plenty of jokes along the way new episodes are released every monday subscribe now at youtube.com forward slash red web pod again that's youtube.com forward slash red web pod i mean just from that description it's if you like this show you're gonna like that show as well just go over check it out grab a couple of episodes and uh, you'll see why and now the casual criminalist hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of the casual criminalist i as always am your host simon on this show what happens is uh, callum writes me a script i've got in front of me right now this is an absolute beast this is actually part one of the Jennings 8. There's part two. And I was like, Callum, why did you split this into two parts? And he's like, well, that's because the, the script I wrote for you, Simon, is actually 40 pages long. <laughs> I don't know. If you're listening to this, you don't see the, the the giant stack of papers that I'm holding up in front of me. But this is an absolute beast of a two-parter. I'm super excited to get into it. I mean, I have honestly no idea. Callum now, pretty much these days, just chooses the topics on his own. Like At the beginning, I was like, yeah, maybe we could do this. Maybe we could do that. So Callum's just like, Simon, I'd like to write about this. And honestly, this far, I'll just like, Callum, mate, go for it. Have fun. And uh, that really means I go in super cold, not knowing anything about it. I mean, unless I've heard of the case before, which does happen. But um, this one, no, it's not familiar. Maybe as we get into it, I'll be like, oh, yeah, this case with this and the, that thing. But no, who knows? What else happens here is I will read it, of course. I'll add some comments when I feel like it. And then Jen afterwards, our wonderful video editor. It's going to add some sounds, some images. It's going to be fun. Let's go. The Eighth. The call was a familiar one. A young woman found dead on the side of the road. She was nude from the waist down, and as was usually the case, there were no clear signs of trauma. Asphyxiation was ruled as the cause of death. When the detectives from the Jennings City Police Department arrived on the scene on August the 19th, 2009, that's a relatively recent case then. I mean, 12 years ago, but compared to some of the other stuff we look at. They experienced a strong sense of deja vu, seeing the pale body of the woman discarded among the weeds by the roadside. This was number eight, the latest in a series of murders that had plagued their small Louisiana town since 2005 and brought no end of shame to the local cops as they failed time and time again to land any convictions. Over the decade which followed that first killing, what began as an unexplained death spiraled out into one of the most complex, most mind-mending criminal cases that you're ever likely to come across. That is an incredibly, like, talk about building like anticipation there. No wonder this is so long. I love mind-mending, particularly mind-mending. A tale of murder on the bayou, of trailer parks and trees and corruption and obstruction in high places. All in all, a proper Cajun spiced conspiracy. But there'll be time for all of that in a moment. The victim this time was identified as 26 year old Nicole Guillory, who was reported missing the evening prior. The maintenance worker had stumbled across her remains about 10 miles to the east of the town. This was just hours after a worried family had logged a missing persons report. To some, Nicole was nothing but the number affixed to her name, number eight. The latest statistic in the city's appalling murder tally, forever tied to the sensational news story brewing in Jennings. But to the four children that she left behind, her devastated parents and her sisters, she was so much more. Their pain joined with the families of the women whose deaths preceded hers in the gruesome sequence. Time and time again, found dead by the drainage canals, swamps, and back roads surrounding Jennings City. This, first and foremost, is their story. The first. 
It all began on the 20th of May 2005. A local fisherman named Jerry Jackson was out fishing for crawfish from a bridge over the Grand Marais Canal on the outskirts of Jennings. As he cast his line out into the murky depths, he spotted a pale silhouette floating in the water. A human-shaped silhouette. I... I saw someone commented on the YouTube version of this show the other day. Like, it seems like fishing seems to be a really nice hobby, except for all the bodies that you have to discover as a fisherman. Because how many times have we started a casual criminalist where it's like a local fisherman? It's like well, he's discovering a body. They're always discovering bodies. Jackson had recently read in the local papers about a heinous crime spree, spree plaguing the town. Local troublemakers were stealing mannequins from clothing stores on Main Street. Real spine-chilling stuff. Yeah, yeah, dude, except this is going to be the real spine-chilling stuff when you find out that it's not a mannequin. So now it's a really, really realistic looking- Oh my god, it's a body! <laughs> so Jackson just assumed that the lady in the water was one of the missing dummies from the newspaper story. Then he came to the realization that mannequins don't attract flies. Seems like the local papers would soon have a lot bigger concerns than some troublesome teens. A dozen officers soon arrived to recover the cadaver, which had been floating in the water for days. Thanks to the muggy heat of the Louisiana spring, decomposition progressed farther than the usual. Still, analysts were able to take fingerprints for identification. That's how a pair of officers found themselves darkening the doorstep of the Lewises. The dead woman in the water was 28-year-old Loretta Lynn Chasson Lewis, a married mother of two. There was no signs of struggle on her remains, besides a small patch of pooled blood under the scalp, and asphyxiation was ruled as the cause of death. And that was basically that as far as the investigation went. No leads, no physical evidence, and no witnesses. At this point, only the city PD were on the case, and as you'll soon find out, they were, how should we put this nicely, terrible at their jobs, terrible, just absolutely god-awful. If that's how you're putting it nicely, Callum, I get the feeling they're absolutely mega f***ing incompetent. Which is certainly not a new thing. Another comment that I read is like, I love how Simon's just finding out how like incompetent the police could be by doing these casual criminalists. It's like, yeah, I guess I had a lot more faith in the police. Say when, height-wise. I'm gonna start up here, just tell me when. I mean, I know the statistics reflect, like, crime is committed and then it's like chances of being caught are like tiny the chances of the police actually getting it to like go through to the court is tiny then the chances of the court actually accepting the case because they think there's enough evidence is tiny then you got to get it past a jury or a judge beyond all res reasonable doubt it's like yeah like crime just doesn't get punished that often i mean i guess for like murders and stuff it's like more but like, it just, it just seems like people get away with crimes a lot. That left the door wide open for the killer or killers to claim a second victim. The second. Less than a month later, a group of timber workers made the find. A young woman's body discarded on the banks of a canal south of town. It seems that the fisherman must have just missed her just off the side of the highway. Unlike in the first case, the cause of death was abundantly clear here, a slit right along the woman's throat. The identification was another matter. So bad was the state of the body that it took bone samples to confirm the woman's identity. Missing persons report suggested that it might be Ernestine Marie Daniels Patterson, but her family would have to endure a long nervous wait for confirmation. After two nerve-shredding months, they received the news that they had been dreading. Even though the body was found just six miles from the last, the police didn't yet believe they were the work of a single culprit. In fact, without a cause of death in the first place, they weren't entirely sure it was actually a homicide. After all, both women had drugs in their system at the time of death, something that would become a recurring theme across the cases. Yeah, and honestly, at this point, don't blame the police. You've got two victims who died in two different ways. Yes, they're of the same profile. They're six miles apart, which is quite a distance, uh, which is not a big distance, but in a city, that's a lot more than like being found six miles apart in the middle of the countryside is like, that's bloody close close six miles in a city is huge like that's from one side of a small city i don't really know <laughs> i'm really struggling to like visualize how big cities actually are but six miles is a long ass way in a city so i'm not like i'm not already like come on cops get it together i'm sure because of what callum wrote that i'm absolutely gonna get there and we're definitely gonna bag on these cops pretty hard but right now i'm like no it's okay cops you're doing okay I wouldn't get there either. But the cops did, however, manage to unearth a valuable lead on this one. A South Jennings prostitute pointed her finger in the direction of a pair of local thugs, Byron Chad Jones and Lawrence Nixon. The witness claimed to have seen them with the victim on the day 
that she disappeared. The pair were charged with second-degree murder, but only ended up spending a short while in jail. The charges were soon dropped due to a lack of concrete evidence. The DA felt that building a case on zero evidence beyond a single witness meant that it was doomed to fail. Yeah, that was what I was saying earlier. Like, the police, they get it to the courts, and then the DA, it's the CPS in the UK, Crown Prosecution Service, get to decide, like, are we actually going to prosecute this? Like, yeah, the police think they've got enough evidence. But it's like, yo, if we don't think that, we're not even going to take it to court because it's just a waste of everyone's time. And like one eyewitness saying that she saw them with these two dudes, it's like that is nowhere close to enough, in my opinion. It would be far too easy for a defense team to undermine a witness with known drug problems. Yes. Oh, also the drugs in the ca- in the system of both of the women, I'm like, uh, so far not enough to tie them together. I, As Caleb says, if more women show up, then it's going to be like, yeah, they're getting drugged, aren't they? They're definitely getting drugged. And so the case remains unsolved, a pretty normal state of affairs for Jennings City. According to the Promise of Justice initiative, the local police had a homicide clearance rate, percentage of crime solved, of just 7% in 2014. That's compared to 64% for the national average? Well, that national average is extraordinarily high. Extraordinarily high. I'm pretty impressed with that. So that's crime solved. It means they found out who did it. It doesn't mean that anyone's going to prison. It's just me, like, or going to court or whatever. It just means they've figured out what it is. But 7% from an average of 64%, how on earth is that allowed? Surely someone, like, from the big police group? I want to say the FBI, but I know that's a totally different thing. Like, whoever controls, like, whatever state government organization, like, at a macro level, is responsible for all of those little police departments, they should be like, yo, guys, you're all f***ing fired and we're going to bring in some people who are absolute, are actually competent at their jobs because 7% is shocking. Might as well be living on the f***ing moon. Give any six-year-old a badge and a gun, and I'm pretty sure that even they could make double digits. Maybe then this would be a far shorter episode. But since the powers that be deny children their God-given right to bear arms, the people of Jennings just had their gloriously inept local PD to rely on. Which is why we're still only a fraction into the parade of misery that kicks off today's story. The third. After Patterson's alleged killers walked free, there was a bit of a lull in murderous activity around the small town of Jennings. Good. The first two deaths, I mean, it's good, but it's also like, if there's more killings, maybe they'll tie them together and we can catch this guy. But it's also, it'd just be nice if there were no, no more killings. It's like, yeah, I'll take two unsolved and no more rather than eight. And then we didn't, I didn't even know if it was solved. This case isn't ringing bells for me. The first two deaths slowly began to be forgotten, as though these two tragedies were just a thing of the past. Little did they know the string of cases would come to define their little town for years to come. On March the 18th, 2007, the silence was broken by the death of Kristen Gary Lopez, a 21-year-old woman found dead in the tall reeds by the edge of a dry drainage canal. Born with developmental difficulties, her father described Kristen as a slow learner who was just getting out there in life. In her teens, she had competed in Special Olympics events before slipping into a drug addiction that turns the final few years of her short life into a tough challenge. She, like the previous two victims, was known to work the streets as a sex worker to fund her addiction. Ah, oh, did we know that the previous two victims were sex workers? I thought that they were... There was one who was hanging out, but I guess now we know more interesting facts. Her friends reported that in the days leading up to her disappearance, Lopez was increasingly paranoid. Not particularly unusual for someone with a crippling drug problem, but given what happened next, people began to wonder if she might not have genuinely known her life was in danger. Not to worry, though, because the fine folks at the Jennings PD were on the case once again. And by this point, the string of cases had drawn the attention of the parish sheriff's office, also based in Jennings. They assigned some of their own manpower to supplement the local department's skeleton crew. And very quickly, they managed to slap the cuffs on another pair of suspects, a man and a woman this time. Nice work, boys, give yourself a pat on the bag, but once again the charges were dropped due to a lack of evidence, another pair of suspects slipping through their fingers. I'm sure the task force detectives all received a nice participation trophy for a job well done. <laughs> yeah, it's like the police should have get participation trophies. Like, ah, oh, yeah, you did. You did try to solve the murder, though, didn't you? Yeah, that's good. You just you tried. You tried. Well done. Good job. Participation trophies suck. Meanwhile, Sheriff Ricky Edwards went about shifting the blame from his bumbling cops and onto the victims themselves. Mate, how are you going to do that? I understand, like, you shifted the blame for not solving the crime onto the victims. How? How are you going to do this? He explained at a press conference that the high-risk lifestyles of the victims, okay, so because they were sex workers, uh, majorly contributed to their deaths. That is not shifting the blame. That is just saying, it's a little bit hard, isn't it? And we're not good enough to solve it. 
I don't understand. That's, that makes no sense. You're the police. Your duty is to, like, protect people. Do your goddamn job, police. Don't be a dick about it. One anonymous relative of Lopez explains it well. It made these girls sound disposable. If they were anything but. To this day, you'll find a plain wooden cross where Kristen Lopez's body was found. Her family come by every now and again, parting the tall reeds to tie fresh flowers to the top. Hidden away from the world, this simple little monument is as invisible as the woman was in life. The Fourth. In case you've not figured it out already, it appears as if the town of Jennings was caught in some sort of sci-fi time loop. Between 2005 and 2009, the same crime basically occurred over and over again, with only very minor variations. Things came full circle less than two months after the last one, on May the 12th. 2007. On that day, police informant and local drug pusher Jamie Trahan was driving along a quiet back road on the outskirts of town. As he approached a crossroad, he saw the crumpled heap of a woman on the corner, naked and beaten. Being an all-round good Samaritan, Trahan stopped, thinking the woman might need help. Wait, <laughs> didn't we just say he was a drug pusher? I'm like, it depends what drugs he's pushing, I guess. I don't really hold much against, like, people dealing pot or like soft drugs and stuff, but it's like, yeah, I've seen Breaking Bad. Look, if you're selling crystal meth, you're probably not a good dude. That shit ruins people's lives. <gasps> I don't think anyone's life is really ruined by marijuana. I mean, maybe it makes them a bit lazy, but and and maybe they eat too much junk food. But it's it's not really that bad, is it? Is it? But at that point, she was long dead. He recognized her instantly. Jennings is a small town, and in its disproportionately active criminal underworld, everyone knows everyone. The one on the side of the road was Whitney Dubois. No wonder it's got a disproportionately sized criminal underworld is because the police don't seem capable of catching anyone who's a criminal, so they all just do excellent. The bruise marks on her body suggested a violent end, but again, there was no clear cause of death. Once again, the coroner filled that box with the words, assumed asphyxiation. The victim's sister, Taylor Dubois, said of the moment the detectives came to her door, I lost my feet and just collapsed. I remember standing on the side of the house and just crying uncontrollably. This was the day before Mother's Day, and as Whitney had left behind a four-year-old daughter, the girl was robbed of that maternal connection for the rest of her life, and unfortunately, she wouldn't be the last one to have her world turned upside down like this. I've only ever seen it in movies, but like when the police come to your door and tell you that, you know, so-and-so's died, that's so intense. Or I guess it's more like military, you know, where it's like, oh my god, this is so intense. The military life and all of this stuff is so intense. And I'm like, can you imagine just sitting around and then it's like those two dudes in their uniforms come up? It's like, oh man, this is so intense. Like, I cannot imagine being in that situation. I'm such a, like, I don't know. It's just too much. It's too much. Like, thinking about one of my kids or like my wife or like my family. And it's just, oh man, that's intense. Like, I have respect to people who can do that. The fifth. This cluster of killings occurred throughout the spring of 2007, culminating with the death of Laconia Muggy Brown, a mother of one and a lifelong resident of Jennings. She was last seen on May the 27th, and the search for her whereabouts was short. Her body was the first to be found within the city limits, on Racker Road. A local police officer was on his way to the firing range in the early hours of the morning when he came across her. <laughs> that was the only crime he solved that year. Probably, uh, wait, it's not solved. He just found a body. <laughs> By coincidence. He's ah, oh, well, got a 7% chance of solving this one. Since she had only been lying there for an estimated six hours, this was the second and last time that a clear cause of death could be confirmed. Laconia's throat had been slit, and there was another curious piece of evidence. Her white tank top was stained pink by some unknown substance. It appeared as if whoever killed her had attempted to destroy any DNA evidence with the use of some sort of bleach. Predictably, there was little physical evidence to be found at the scene, and no leads came to anything. Five victims, nothing. I mean, I would say it's impressive if, it, if that didn't sound so insane. The Sixth I know this parade of misery might seem a bit monotonous. The same story told eight times over, but that's exactly as it was experienced by the citizens of Jennings, especially the marginalized women who lived in fear that they might be next in the obituaries. The town got another short-lived respite as things remained quiet for over a year, but in September 2008, the familiar smell of decay returned to the air. Quite literally, the next body was found when a group of hunters walked past the overgrown bed of a dry drainage canal southeast of town and recognized the smell instantly. Among the reeds, police found the body of Crystal Shea Benoit Zeno. She had been missing for two weeks, and the cause of death was once again 
impossible to determine for sure. Crystal had only recently moved to the area. Prior to that, she worked at a fast food restaurant in nearby Lake Arthur. She, her husband, and young daughter came to the city just four months before the murder, hoping for a fresh start. But instead, their family life came to an abrupt end. Diagnosed with bipolar at a young age, Crystal turned to drugs in her teens as a coping mechanism. Just like all of the other victims, a substantial part of her life was spent in proximity to the murky underworld of the town. Perhaps that's how the killer first set their eyes on her. Yeah, almost certainly. I mean, especially with retrospect, we can see that many of these women were sex workers or involved in the underworld somehow. That's almost certainly how it happened. That, that maybe I'll be proven wrong, but seems pretty locked in. Now, with six victims all dead in similar circumstances, the people of Jennings were all but convinced they had a classic serial killer story on their hands. Yeah, it seems extremely likely. Uh, I Callum hasn't mentioned anything about the police investigation on these last few victims, but I'm assuming at this point, even with a 7% conviction rate, they're beginning to tie a few things together. At least I would seriously hope so. I mean, they should all be fired anyway. 7% is embarrassing. But, I mean, really? The Seventh The idea of a serial killer at work around Jennings does seem like the logical conclusion at this point. However, the sheriff's department was reluctant to officially confirm the crimes as one big interconnected murder case. In fact, some of the deaths still weren't even definitively ruled as homicides. Is late night swamp swimming a popular activity down in Louisiana? Probably not, so the idea that these women wandered off to secluded areas and died accidentally isn't that convincing to me. Didn't a couple of them slit their throats? It's like, yeah, yeah, we went swimming in a swamp, killed and slit my throat to. Like, what? No. No, this is all connected. Come on. It was the generally accepted theory around town that a single person or group of people was killing them. And so a Jennings private investigator named Kirk Menard was hired by some of the families to follow up on the theory, as by this point, they had no faith in the sheriff and his cronies. It's a bit sad when it's like that you have to hire your own people to investigate a murder case. It's like, I get it if it's an adult who's missing and the police are like, yo, adults go missing all the time because they run away from their lives. Hire a private detective. But when it's like, there's probably a serial killer who killed our daughter. And it'd be like, police, I feel like this should be your number one priority. Like, immediately. Drop everything else you're working on and find this person. Like, what are we paying taxes for? Come on, get on it. <laughs> get on it now. In the autumn of 2008, Menard spoke to a criminal profiler, hoping to get an idea of the psychology of the killer or killers he was hunting. The profiler gave him an ominous warning that there would be another woman found dead before Christmas, and sure enough, his prophecy came true. It's not a prophecy, he's just an expert at what he does. He probably saw a pattern. On November 2nd, 2008, now 17-year-old, or oh, was it him? It probably wasn't him. 17-year-old Brittany Gary left her home and walked to the dollar store to top up her phone. The family had recently returned from a four-month stint in Texas, where they made a go at a fresh start. Unfortunately, it never worked out, and they were forced to return to Jennings, the city where Brittany had fallen under the influence of a bad crowd and drug addiction. Her mother claims that Brittany managed to stay clean for the entirety of their time in Texas and was determined to distance herself from her old friends after this unhappy homecoming. But that wouldn't be easy. Brittany was closely connected to many of the previous victims. She was a good friend of Dubois and Brown, the cousin of Lopez, and Daniels used to work with her and her mother at Wendy's Diner in town. Four close acquaintances dead in as many years, it was little wonder that Brittany was so uneasy being back at home. Shortly before she went missing, the teenager told her mother that she no longer knew who to trust. Rumors were circulating about who might have killed her friends, some of them associated with powerful people in town. So when the teenager never returned from the dollar store that evening, her family feared the worst. She could be seen on CCTV cameras buying the top up at 5.30 p.m. alone, but after that, there was no trace of her. That was until her body was found at the side of a back road two weeks later. Her remains were in much the same state as her friends before her. The pile of death hanging over her hometown brought an end to her young life before it had even really begun. By this point, it was clear that the sheriff's office and the city PD were about as effective as a bunch of monkeys with magnifying glasses, I'd say perhaps even less effective. Things had gotten so bad that Jefferson Davis Parish Sheriff Ricky Edwards had to bring in the big guns that December. He announced the formation of a joint local, state, federal task force in December, meaning the FBI would be lending a hand to the case. I always see, like in movies, the FBI are super competent. And so can you imagine like being the FBI, super competent, wearing a suit and stuff, here to solve some crimes? And you're like, oh, God, we got to work with these guys who have a 7% success rate on their cases. They, it's gonna be, this is going to be difficult. This is going to be very difficult. And they probably don't like us being there because they're like, oh, man, you guys are actually competent. 
That makes us look bad. The seventh death brought a wave of fresh interest and bumped the reward for information from $35,000 to $85,000 overnight, but this still wasn't enough to deter who was slaughtering innocents in Jennings. It's rumored that not long after the formation of the task force, a local prostitute approached the detectives with an eerie premonition. There would be another victim, and she knew the name, Nicole Guillory. This unlikely oracle was spot on. Guillory was indeed the eighth victim, the one from the start of the episode and the last of the Jennings Eight. So now you've got your bearings, right? You're all caught up with the horrible deaths at the center of the whole affair. And ready for me to tell you how they brought this nefarious serial killer to justice? Well, I'm afraid you're gonna be waiting for a while. The thing about the Jennings Eight case is, whenever you start to feel like you've found your footing, the rug gets ripped right out from underneath you. The murders themselves were just the beginning of a true crime saga filled with more twists than the entire filmography of M. Night Sham. Ah, oh, this guy's name. Shamalamian? Shyamalan? Shyamalan? Let's just call him M. Night. It's not even relevant to our story. His movies are so weird. Sometimes really good, sometimes absolutely terrible. I'm truly sorry for what I've done to you and yours. Did he do Sixth Sense? I think he did. That was really good. Quite a lot of drama to pack into a small town of only 10,000 folk, but Jennings, Louisiana was no ordinary small town. A Bayou Battleground Located in southeast Louisiana, Jennings is the primary city of Jefferson Davis Parish. The town is smack bang in the middle of southern swampland, surrounded by a network of rivers and bogs where the air hangs thick and heavy. Classic Creole country. It was the north side of town, and you'll find normal suburban neighborhoods affluent enough and filled with regular everyday families. However, running diagonally through the town is a train track that divides the city almost perfectly in half. South of this unofficial border is another city entirely, filled with rough neighborhoods, plagued by drugs, and racked with violence. Eight murders for a town of 10,000 is quite a shocking statistic, especially since these weren't the only murders during that time. In fact, if you measure the murder rate per capita, Jennings, Louisiana's murder rate was actually on par with some of America's most murdery cities in certain years. The three killings we covered from 2007 would currently see them ranked eighth, tucked nicely between Kansas City and New Orleans. Part of the reason for the town's troubles is the Interstate 10 highway, which passes right through Jennings. The flow of drugs down this popular smuggling corridor has brought a heavy dose of drugs and violence to what might otherwise be a totally nondescript little town. The sediment of vice washed into Jennings by that infamous route seems to have accumulated heavily in certain pockets of town. Well, it usually does. I mean, there's nice parts of town, there's bad parts of town. I mean, it seems like Jennings is to split down the middle by a train track, which is weird. But it's like any town you live in, I mean, unless it's a really tiny village, there's going to be rough parts and there's going to be nice parts. Everywhere I've lived in my life, it's like there's nice parts of town and there's shitty parts of town. Try and live in the nice parts. Maybe you have to live in the rough parts. It is what it is. And when the smugglers made their way down this highway from Houston to New Orleans and back again, there was one spot in particular where they used to stop. The Bordreau Inn. This dismal little single-story motel sat right off the I-10, and before its closure, it was one of the most notorious hotbeds of criminal activity in Jennings. Eventually, its reputation meant that the local police would swing by almost daily, looking for busts to fill the quotas. It was fertile grounds for that sort of thing indeed. The Bordreau was reportedly the place to go for whatever shady shit you needed. People sold drugs, muscle, and of course, their bodies. In fact, every single one of the Jennings Eight plied their trade at the Bordreau at one time or another. They all knew each other by name and moved in the same circles. <laughs> okay, considering this, it's like, how did the police not put this together after like, I get the first two. That's a coincidence. When it's the third one, it's like, it's like, come on, come on, really, come on, let's get to it. Being regulars of the Bordreau, it's undeniable that they would have been known faces to a myriad of underworld figures. Young thugs they would have known since school, out-of-town drug runners, local pimps, promising them protection. The question is, did someone among this rogues gallery want to see all these young women dead, or were the deaths the work of a sadistic serial killer John, a la Gary Ridgway, or Peter Sutcliffe? Welcome to the Dirty South. After the death of the eighth victim, Louisiana's most violent small town, probably, became a hotbed of activity. With the state and federal investigators came a torrent of media interest as cable news companies jostled for space by the banks of the drainage canals where the remains of the women were found. The public was growing increasingly desperate for answers, so Sheriff Edwards called a conference. With the FBI agents and police chief Johnny Laster by his side, he finally acknowledged the theory that was on everyone's minds. It is the collective opinion of all agencies involved in this investigation that these murders 
murders may have been committed by a common offender. Well done, guys. It only took you eight bodies to get there. So what do we make of that? It would be far from unusual for a serial killer to target sex workers. You'll find the same story told time and time again all around the world, indeed all the time on this podcast. But was it really applicable here? While some of the indicators did seem apparent, for one, all the women fit a similar profile. They were all young, addicted to drugs, had petty criminal records, and were known to work in prostitution to fund their habits. What's more, it's possible that the method of murder might have remained roughly consistent too, if strangulation really was the cause of death in six out of eight. But even with all the might of the bureau behind them, the task force was unable to make any headway with the serial killer investigation. Whoever the Jennings Ripper was, he or she had covered their tracks well enough that the team found found only dead ends in every direction. In 2010, the New York Times reported on the aura of frustration and fear around Jennings, with now no new leads in over a year. For all intents and purposes, it seemed like a lost cause. Until... The story of the Jennings 8 received a second wind via the most entertaining crime story cliché there is. The arrival of a one-man investigative powerhouse determined to throw a grenade in the punch bowl and blow the case wide open. This was a man by the name of Ethan Brown, a writer based out of New Orleans who covered crime stories for the likes of Rolling Stone and New York Magazine. A journalist by day, Ethan also moonlighted as a licensed PI, a job which mostly consists of photographing cheating spouses as they leave hotels. Wow, this guy is living the, like, classic, I don't know, what's the word for this, but, like, uh, you know those old novels where it's, like, the P.I., the crime journalist, this dude. Love it. But Ethan had his eye on bigger things than naughty husbands doing the walk of shame. Whenever he traveled east down Interstate 10 towards Jennings, he passed a billboard that always played on his mind for days afterwards. It was plastered with the faces of the eight missing women, with an appeal for information below. Each and every time he saw it, he wondered how it was possible that such little progress could have been made after so much death. Well, mate, what's his name? Ethan, all you have to do is go look up that National Crime Statistics database and see that the cops of Jenny are solving 7% of the crimes. And you'll be like, oh, there we go, that's why. Over the years, the notion of doing a little digging himself grew into a concrete plan. He would spend a week in Jennings just to satiate his curiosity. At this point, he had no idea that the strange happenings in the town would become the white whale of his career. This guy's a legend. When he's like, yeah, yeah, he's a journalist, a crime journalist, he's a PI on the side, and he's just rolling along, and he's like, I'm going to go to the town and solve that crime. Why not? Someone committed a crime. In preparation for his little excursion, Ethan started digging around in the public records for any information pertaining to the murders. The deeper he delved into this mammoth research binge, pouring through hundreds of transcripts, witness statements, and local news articles, the more he confirmed his suspicion. The serial killer theory didn't make sense. Oh, it didn't make sense. It seems very serial killery. I mean, come on. Or it's like a group of people who are killing them, but like a gang, maybe? It feels super serial killery, though. For one, the FBI were contradicting themselves by entertaining the idea of a single culprit in the first place. Their own behavioral analysis unit's teachings have it that serial killer cases usually feature strangers with no visible relationship between the offender and the victim. But how could it be possible when all these women were so closely linked together? These women were friends, colleagues, and relatives, all connected in a tangled web of relations. They bought from the same dealers, frequented the same bars, and went to the same schools. <laughs> Such a boring person. When Callum wrote they bought from the same dealers, I was like, oh, they, they went to the same car dealership. But no, it's drugs. Your typical serial killer would never target a group of victims so clustered together socially. This suggested that there was some other motive, some reason that all of these women were being killed, and maybe even a common element in their lives, an individual who caused or ordered their deaths. As I said earlier on, earlier on whenever you think you're getting a grasp on this case, the rug gets pulled out from underneath you. Yeah, I'm feeling like that rug got pulled out. I feel like Callum led me down the path of like, this is definitely a serial killer and the police need to get their sh** together. And now I'm being told this isn't a serial killer? What could have all these women possibly known that they needed to get killed over by a gang? Or like whatever Callum's implying now, which I also don't believe because I'm sure he's just going to pull the rug out from underneath me in the next hundred pages or however crazy long this thing is. Ethan Brown was convinced that the task force assigned to the case were looking in all the wrong places for an individual that probably didn't exist. He rejected the idea that this could be some sexually motivated killing sex workers just for the thrill of it. The key to it lay in the lives of the women themselves. This line of reasoning would lead him towards some pretty extraordinary discoveries and potentially a very palpable threat against his own life. Yeah, I mean, look, mate, if you're going to go investigating a murder of eight people, I, I would be like, yeah, it's probably, it's probably not the safest thing to do on the weekend, is it? Nope. 
As a man who spends all of his days behind the safety of a computer screen, I have to really commend people like Ethan Brown for getting down into the nitty gritty so we don't have to. The risk of me getting shot by a crack dealer as I sit here in my jammies is hopefully near zero. Yeah, I have to say, like, I mean, I do super appreciate how low risk my life is. It's like I went mountain biking a few weeks ago and I broke my collarbone. I was like, oh, <laughs> it's literally the most dangerous and scary thing that happened to me in a long, long time probably in a decade and i'm like it is nice that my life is just so safe <laughs> when an out-of-towner steps over the train tracks into south jennings and starts asking questions there's every chance he might rub some pretty rough characters up the wrong way but if he was going to make any more progress on his investigation he needed to start interviewing the people involved in the case people who might be more likely to talk to an independent writer than a cop I feel like this must be set before Netflix. Oh, this isn't set. This is a real story, Simon. What are you talking about? I feel like this definitely, and it did happen before like Netflix started making these shows where it's like they investigate stuff and it like gets really intense and it actually makes a difference in criminal cases because now people would be like, you're making a Netflix show, aren't you? I'm going to get arrested. I'm going to end up in jail because of this. That meant that the next step was boots on the ground research, which opened him up to the threat of violence as he immersed himself in the dark dealing of Jennings's underbelly. In 2012, Ethan took time off from his day job and booked a room in town for seven days. Here, it's confident, man. I mean, the police have not solved this thing in years. Granted, they are extremely incompetent. They're like, nah, I'm going to go there. Take me about a week and I'll crack that thing, no worries. He arrived in Jennings in the heavy heat of summer with swarms of mosquitoes on his windshield and born on the bayou blasting from his stereo. Probably not, but that's how we choose to imagine it. His itinerary consisted of interviews with anyone who would speak to him, ex-cops, friends of the victims, dealers. That's how he first discovered the connections between the women were even stronger than he first thought. They all ran in the same circle, circles in which a violent death isn't as unlikely as it should be. About halfway through this preliminary research trip, he made the acquaintance of a local drug dealer named David Bowlegs Des Hotel. These names are difficult to pronounce. Everyone from this place has strange names. The man had gained his unusual nickname on account of a recent gunshot to the left leg, which had left him with a limp and on crutches. Brown later told Rolling Stone he had just been shot and was kind of a mess. Still, Bowlegs provided a valuable introduction to the underworld of Southern Jennings, the names of some important characters that the journo might want to talk to. Old Bowlegs might have had a bigger part in our Southern crime epic, but unfortunately, his appearance is only a brief cameo. I met him around sunset one evening, and I woke up the next morning to the news that had been murdered a few hours earlier. <laughs> I was like, oh, what am I doing here? What decision have I made? I just want to go back home and write crime stories and spy on husbands cheating on their wives. Come on! Farewell, Bowlegs. We hardly knew ye. This was one more unsolved murder to add to the cops' shameful tally, and Ethan was about to see firsthand why their clearance rate was so abysmal. When he went around to Bowlegs' house later that day, the place was an absolute riot. The police hadn't even cordoned off the area, despite the fact that the dealer was gunned down inside the residence, so the neighborhood was treating his passing as an impromptu garage sale. People were walking in and out freely, some of them even lifting items from the scene to take home. Imagine a comical parade of crackheads walking out with a toaster, the TV, the fridge, while Ethan looks on in horror. <laughs> the level of incompetence is just extraordinary, isn't it? Is that actually amazing? As I know, I was shot. Yeah, it's cool. The police probably nicked some of his not really allegedly, please don't sue me. Needless to say, the scene would have been contaminated beyond salvage. The journalist actually had some interviews scheduled with ex-cops later in the day as he told them what he saw. They said essentially, welcome to Jennings, we're sure you've never seen anything like this in your life. And these were cops. This was his unhappy welcome into the so-called Dirty South's Dark Side, a world in which the law can sometimes be more of a suggestion than a rule. A world in which the minute someone starts running their mouth, they often wind up dead soon after. This would become a recurring theme as Ethan returned to the town dozens of times over the following years, each time adding new pieces to the puzzle of the Jennings Eight. Of course, Bowlegs' untimely death likely had nothing to do with their little conversation. The guy had just taken a bullet to the leg, so he was already a target for whatever reason. Yeah, be like, <laughs> if he got shot in the leg, they probably missed. They're coming back for you, Bowlegs. Get out of town. And honestly, journo, get out of town as well. This doesn't sound like a good place. I'd just be so out of there. I mean, I'd never go there in the first place. I'm such a massive coward. But then I'd be like, oh my god, the first person I talked to has already been murdered. 
and it's a joke and the police are a joke if i get murdered here no one's gonna ever know what happened to me i want to leave however the serendipitous timing of the death certainly left an impression on the reporter especially given what he found out next after several more months spent digging into the dark underbelly of the town one curious fact came to light which seemed to match the theme all eight of the victims were allegedly known police informants who passed on information about the local drug trade if there's one thing i know snitches get stitches and uh yeah in this case just get murdered just get absolutely murdered that seems like a fairly strong uh motive for murder for example miss gurry had quite a long rap sheet to her name but even in cases with strong evidence the da declined to pursue charges against her she was either extremely lucky or possessed the sort of privilege reserved for police collaborators this supported ethan's theory of violent retaliation perhaps from some powerful underworld figures in town frankie richard king of pimps Needless to say, Ethan Brown made the acquaintance of many extravagant characters during his jaunts in Jennings, plenty of people who might have had the means and mentality to kill eight women. But one name in particular kept popping up time and time again frankie richard by way of introduction i think it's best to let the eloquent mr richard speak for himself my most memorable way of making a living was selling pussy oh i see he's not eloquent it's sarcasm we sold pussy any and every f way we could i did not pimp them girls i introduced them to older men that wanted to spend some money on a young gal i am making sure they are getting their money making sure they're not getting out mate oh my god you were a pimp what god no <laughs> i feel like you need to look up what a pimp is because you are a pimp making money making sure they're not getting hurt that is a pimp my dude uh so like <laughs> a pimp yeah, Callum and I are exactly the same page on this one. It's kind of like saying, I didn't murder those people, I just reduced their heart rates to zero. Despite his glaring lack of self awareness, nobody else in town was under any delusions regarding old pimping Frankie's occupation. It's a pimp. No! Are you even listening to the story? He maintained a legitimate front as the owner of a local strip club. When your le- when your legitimate business is strip club, it's like you know your your le- illegitimate business is well. I mean, we know you're a pimp. He had made his money on the oil field and later a dump truck business before trading in that life for these less conventional occupations. Exactly the sort of person you'd expect to know all the comings and goings of a town's illicit industries. He's like he's like the dodgy guy in town. There's always you know. There's one dodgy guy, and this guy's it. He knows what's going on. He knows everybody. He's involved in some things he probably shouldn't be involved in. After setting up his strip club, it wasn't long before Frankie started inviting his employees back to his house. He allegedly used their drug addictions to coerce them into prostitution, offering them small amounts of drugs in exchange for servicing his friends and associates. He was apparently well known for gleefully recanting how he degraded and manipulated the women under his control. Lovely guy. And definitely a pimp. It's like, no, 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 I wasn't here for money. It was for drugs. It's like, you need to look at the definition of pimp. By the time Ethan Brown made his acquaintance, Frankie Richard was in his mid-fifties, but Jesus did he look a lot older than that. It's not hard living. Rocky bushy hair and a horrifically unkempt beard. In certain mugshots, he looked like Charles Manson's rougher, druggier twin. Frankie's own long-term addictions had clearly taken a toll on his body. Yet still, he had a powerful respect among the criminals of Jennings. Ethan wrote about visiting Frankie on his front porch many times, becoming an unexpected confidant to the ragged pimp. On one of his visits, a street thug stepped out of his car and literally bowed to the king, sitting on his wicker throne. It's like a scene out of a movie. Even the guy coming in and being like, yeah, yeah, I'm a reporter, but I'm going to be your friend and we'll have a chat. It's amazing. I feel like this hasn't been made into a movie, but it definitely should be. As Ethan dug deeper into the case, this fidgety kingpin appeared to be the local focal point of the whole affair. A friend of some of the victims told him, basically, Kristen, Loretta, Whitney, they all hung around with Frankie. Frankie sold drugs. If they couldn't get it from somebody, they got it from him. In fact, every single one of the victims was involved with Frankie in one way or another, besides Ernestine Patterson. Add to that the fact that Jamie Trayon, the guy who found the body of Dubois, was a known lackey of the pimp king and so were the two men arrested in the ernestine patterson case in fact the case files for a lot of the murders mention frankie by name or list his known associates as a person of interest and oh i almost forgot there's the little matter that frankie richard was actually charged with one of the murders already this guy's definitely got something to do with it right yeah remember the man and woman 
duo who were arrested for the murder of a developmentally disabled victim, Lopez. That was Frankie and his niece, Hannah Connor. The pimp seemed to be on good terms with the victim at the time. She would even affectionately call him Uncle Frankie. But when her body was found, a local prostitute named Tracy Chasson filed a report with the police alleging that Frankie and his niece had actually killed and disposed of the young woman. Frankie was in jail for an unrelated rape charge at the time, so the authorities already had him right where they wanted him. Again, lovely guy. This dumpster fire of a scumbag, yes, was charged with murder in the second degree, as was his niece. The two were looking at some serious prison time. If you think Chasson might have been lying, consider the fact that her story actually implicated herself and she was arrested as an accessory after the fact. Frankie, of course, always denied his involvement in Lopez's death, protesting, Poor little Kristen, I was not there, did not have anything to do with her death, and if I was there, it wouldn't have happened, not without it happening to me too. Okay. But the victim in that rape case he was fighting at the time saw a very different side of this fatherly, sentimental human trafficker. After the attack, he reportedly told her, If you tell anyone b you'll end up like the others. Holy s***. <laughs> Allegedly said that, right? I mean, because that sounds like, okay, you definitely are just admitting to killing a bunch of people. It's up to you to guess what others he meant. Oh, we guessed it was the other victims. It was all the people who were murdered. This might be why witnesses in both cases ultimately recanted and or altered their statements, and both cases fell apart. Frankie Boy dodged two bullets within the span of just a few months, coming out completely unscathed despite being directly accused by eyewitnesses. Seems unbelievable, doesn't it? Well, that's just Frankie. This rotting lump of manure had a stunning 23 arrests to his name and a conversion rate of worse than 7%, 0%, zero convictions despite all the witness testimony, violent behavior, and even physical evidence which cropped up over the years. How could this be possible? Well, probably because they're all cropping up on like random different cases. It's like, yo, we know you're guilty of one of these things. You seem like an absolute piece of of a human being, but we just can't pin any one of them on you. And that sucks, but it's, I'm sure it's barely regularly happening. The answer to that laid Ethan Brown deeper down the rabbit hole and toward some shocking conclusions which he'd never have thought possible when his journey in Jennings first began. Chevy Gate You've already seen how terrible the Jennings City Police Chief, Parish Sheriff, and their lackeys were at securing crime scenes, and honestly, it seems everything else. The only question is, were they just incompetent, indifferent, or maybe something more sinister? Well, Callum, you mentioned at the beginning like a conspiracy, and I mean they might be terrible. But I'm like, yeah, there's a difference between like shit policing and like fully corrupt, you know, policing. <laughs> one is bad, one is ter is is worse, much worse than bad. Okay. This is where things really begin to twist and turn. It seems like we'd gotten to the bottom of the story, a sadistic pimp taking revenge on women for snitching on his operation, simple enough. But no, that would be too easy. And well, we know this is a two-part episode. Because see, not only was Frankie Boy a key player in the Jennings underworld, he also appears to have been quite cozy with the Jennings City PD themselves. That would seem to explain why he appeared bulletproof to prosecution, despite such classic catchphrases as we sold pussy any and every f***ing where we could, and if you tell anyone, you'll end up dead like the others. How is this guy getting off? How is this guy getting off? And if Frankie really was offing snitches, then he was a world class hypocrites. Back in the early days of the investigation, P.I. Kirk Menard instructed two key witnesses to go and speak to the task force about their experiences with the middle-aged pimp. When they did, a high-ranking member allegedly told them, don't worry about Frankie, because he works for me. What better way to battle rivals than weaponize the law through collaboration? This brings certain episodes in this story into sharper focus. For example, the reason the two suspects were released in the Ernestine Patterson case, victim number two, was because of a severe bit of oversight on the part of the city police. Testing at the alleged crime scene didn't occur until 15 months later. Okay, so that's the sounding like they're not incompetent. It's like they're protecting their informant. And I mean, but when your informant's like a savage pimp murderer, do we have to like, I mean, just be like, okay, we can probably make do without the savage pimp murderer informants because it'd be really nice if he was in prison. I'm no forensic expert nor a qualified dry cleaner, but I'm fairly sure 15 months is plenty of time to wash out even the toughest bloodstains. 
but that doesn't instantly mean foul play on the part of the police, though. It's worth noting that a case of this caliber is a lot for a small town police department to handle, and the terrible truth is that the deaths of marginalized women often get treated with less urgency anyway. At this point, they were just two victims in, and they had no idea the national media would one day be rolling into town to criticize their less than thorough methods. But with that being said, it does seem like certain elements in the police force may have been taking active efforts to defend our crack adult crime lord all along. Ethan Brown identified one episode in the saga as the smoking gun, which suggests the high possibility of collusion between some members of law enforcement and everyone's favorite pimp overlord. Remember how Frankie himself was brought in on a second-degree murder charge alongside his niece Hannah? Well, there's a bit more to that story than I let on. While Uncle Frankie and his accomplice were sitting in the jail cells where they most likely belonged, the vehicle which he allegedly used to transport the body was just sitting out there, waiting to be combed by the forensics team. Okay, this sounds brilliant, and it sounds like a bunch of evidence is about to pile on top of him. One anonymous ex-detective told Ethan Brown that this truck was identified as significant very early on in their inquiries, a fact disputed by then-Sheriff Ricky Edwards. Either way, they hadn't yet got around to confiscating it. Doing so might have been somewhat complicated by the fact that it had never belonged to the accused accused, but rather to a woman named Connie Siler. A key witness claimed to have been told the story of what happened next from Hannah Connor herself, part of a drugged-up confession in which she also allegedly admitted the murder. This is the second episode. In, uh, the, the last episode I recorded, I don't know if they'll come out in this order, it was the same thing. A guy got on drugs and then he admitted to a murder. And it's like, oh, don't do that. That's, that's not a good idea. Or rather, drugged up boasting about how she and her uncle got away with murder. Don't do that. Don't write down your crimes. Don't admit your crimes. Don't tell people about your crimes. Don't involve people with your crimes. It's not complicated, criminals. According to the witness, Siler provided Frankie Richard with the truck and then he loaded it with a barrel, a barrel which contained the body of Kristen Lopez. And it just so happens that, when the alleged killers were arrested, Miss Siler herself was resting her head in the local jail after being picked up for forging checks. It appears as if the warden of the jailhouse or one of the jailers passed this information along to the powers that be at the sheriff's office. On the tape, the woman says, An officer named Mr. Warren, I don't know the exact name, he bought the truck to discard the evidence. That Okay, we're doing some high-level corruption shit right now. If it was to be believed, then an officer of the law actively disposed of evidence to help Frankie Richard walk free, and Ethan recognized the man she meant, Warren Gary. He was actually the lead investigator on the sheriff's office task force in those early days. Apparently, him and Frankie Richard were good friends. You guys, you got to stop protecting your informant. This is crazy. You can't be disposing of bodies for them. That is so illegal. And these are the people you need to find informants against. <laughs> Please. Gary met Connie Siler, a known associate of Frankie, for a standard police interview. But what followed was anything but standard procedure. During the interview, he just randomly decided to purchase her truck, despite having a car of his own already. Nothing to see here. Move along. Siler needed the money to pay back bad checks she had written, so she eagerly accepted. After that, Warren Gary decided to take the truck to the car wash at Ray's Laundry and Fixtures just across from the task force HQ and scrubbed his new ride clean in every nook and cranny. Nothing to see here. Move along. <laughs> Then he decided to flip the truck for profit one month later, meaning that this key piece of evidence would be contaminated with the prints and DNA of potentially dozens of people and be rendered utterly worthless. Again, nothing to see here. Move along. Now, if this were all just hearsay, then we could quite easily discount it as nonsense, but the sale was actually conducted totally legally, and there's a paper trail to verify it. Sure enough, Gary's purchase and the sale of a 2006 uh, Chevy Silverado were right there for anyone to see. It didn't slip the notice of his superiors either. Back in 2007, he was fined $10,000 by the State Ethics Committee for the unethical purchase, but the possibility of destruction of evidence was never followed up on. $10,000 for a police officer? How much do police officers earn? That's a lot of money. That's a mega amount of money. His conduct was only ever, ever ruled as unethical, not criminal. From one angle, it looks like an opportunistic cop taking advantage of a suspect's tough situation, but when you consider the bigger picture, it looks a lot like a figure right at the top of the investigative body actively mobilizing to protect Jennings's king pimp from prosecution. Yeah, dude, it does. I mean, it's so suspicious. That's enough bombshells for one day. This is a lot to digest, so take a second if you need to. Of course, Frankie himself vehemently denies being a snitch. That's not a label that you want when you're neck deep in the violent Louisiana underworld. But then again, he vehemently denied being a pimp too. <laughs> he just seems very confused about what a pimp is though, to give him some credit. It does seem like he genuinely doesn't know. 
Um, and also, but you're getting so much protection from the cops. Either you are so dangerous that you've somehow managed to get all of these cops under your thumb somehow, or you're providing them with information, which seems more likely. But also, he does seem like a scary dude. Whatever the case, Frankie the snitching pimp was now free to go. Chasson's ever-shifting testimony rendered her an unreliable witness and the charges against all three were dropped. Frankie remained a free man throughout Ethan Brown's investigation. He just walked out of jail, clicked his heels, and got right back to business. Just as Ethan Brown told the Washington Post, he flaunts his impunity. It has this really frightening effect on the entire parish. Life went on in Jennings. The five other victims lost their lives and no more charges were brought for any of their murders. As for Warren Gary, the man who may have just destroyed a crucial piece of evidence, he was reprimanded after that brush with the ethics board, then given a promotion running the evidence room. Holy sh**, what are you up to, police? It's like, yeah, this guy who like bought evidence and then destroyed evidence for someone else and got a $10,000 fine from the ethics committee. Let's promote him to be in charge of where like if it goes missing it's really bad news this is why you have a seven percent rate because you suck we're either dealing with the most oblivious cops in the world or the most corrupt then sheriff ricky edwards told brown i don't think it was a bad decision i understand how some people would question that but no i don't think it was a bad decision we're questioning it because it's a bad decision mate i think we can all agree that giving a man suspected of destroying evidence the key to the evidence room was a bad idea yes it's like assigning a public masturbator to the women's underwear section at walmart both will have an absolute field day and probably ruin a lot of the inventory oh callum no that's not to say gary really did make things disappear during his time in the evidence room but i sure as hell would have put it past him especially given the well-documented history of sticky fingers and corruption among Jennings's finest, which stretches back decades. In fact, in the records of this small town, you'll find so many instances of blatant corruption and abuse of power that it's actually quite comical. Be sure not to wear your nice shoes for part two, because we'll be jumping right down into the mucky swamp of those dirty dealings and wading through all the stuff that the sheriff of Jefferson Davis Parish would prefer that you didn't know and that's it for part one join us soon when we bring the story of ethan brown's investigation to a close and explore just how far the case has progressed since he bombarded us with all of this barrage of bombshells so many questions remain unanswered will the people who murdered the jennings eight be brought to justice will ethan come out of this investigation unscathed will any crooked cops face justice and will frankie richard pimp extraordinaire finally find true love Tune in next time to find out. <laughs> and with that rather cheesy TV ending, this has been an episode of The Casual Criminalist, part one of two. As Callum said, tune in again next time for the second part. I'm sure, it's going to be a good one. It is extremely long again. This is such a long Casual Criminalist with so many twists and turns. I hope Callum sums it up next time at the beginning, because otherwise I'm going to be out like, what was happening again. <laughs> it's like whenever I watch TV shows, I'm always like, we have to watch that recap. Even I know we just watched the last episode of this last night, but I need the recap every time. Anyway, as I said, this has been The Casual Criminalist. I've been Simon. Thank you to both Callum and Jen who helped me put this together. Thank you for watching. If you're enjoying this show, if you enjoyed it, please do leave a review if you're listening in its podcast form, or if you're on YouTube, subscribe, smash that like button, and I'll see you next time.